The physics demonstration, which inspired me to go on and study physics and become a physics teacher, was electron diffraction, or electrons acting as waves. Sadly, without better funding, almost no school science department will be able to afford the £1,000 to buy a new electron diffraction tube, which led me to gamble £100 on buying a vintage one, which wasn't tested. So you can imagine my delight as I increased the accelerating voltage and the magical rings produced by the electron diffraction appeared. At the back of the evacuated tube is a filament which is heated and gives out electrons by thermionic emission. Here you can see it glowing an orangey-red colour. A little further on up the tube is the anode which is connected to a few thousand volts and this accelerates the electrons once they've been emitted thermionically from the filament. At the end of the electron gun is a thin layer of polycrystalline graphite which acts as a diffraction grating. At the end of the tube is a phosphorescent coating which when the electrons hit it they convert their kinetic energy into light which allows us to see where the electrons are arriving. The electron's wavelength is given by Planck's constant divided by their momentum. So can you predict what will happen to the diffraction pattern when I decrease the voltage that is accelerating the electrons. A lower accelerating voltage will mean the electrons have a larger de Broglie wavelength, which will mean they will be diffracted more and the rings should get larger, which we can see happens as we reduce the accelerating voltage. The opposite happens as we increase the accelerating voltage, the electrons get a shorter de Broglie wavelength and are diffracted less, so the rings get smaller. A full explanation would say if we accelerate with a smaller accelerating voltage then the electrons gain less kinetic energy which means they have a lower speed which means they have a lower momentum and therefore the de Broglie wavelength which is the Planck's constant divided by momentum will get larger which means the electrons are diffracted more and we get the larger rings. But what we haven't done yet is explain why we get the rings. But since the electrons are behaving as waves Let's see if we can use light to explain what's going on. I've set a violet laser shining at a white piece of paper and the white paper fluoresces so the violet laser actually looks a light blue colour in the video. Inserting a diffraction grating, which is a large number of slits, produces a wave interference pattern of dots on my piece of paper. Inserting a diffraction grating with more lines per millimetre or the slits closer together increases the separation of the dots but it's certainly not producing circles. So let's think about what's actually diffracting the electrons, the graphite. The carbon atoms in graphite, of course, have a hexagonal structure and the planes of the atoms can act like slits of a diffraction grating, as I've illustrated here with the blue dotted lines. But because of the rotational symmetry, there will actually be three sets of slits all acting at the same time which I've shown with the blue, yellow and red lines. Here they are superimposed on top of each other. So if I'm going to make this for light, I would need to have three diffraction gratings stacked on top of each other at these different angles. In fact, there is a, another set of planes of atoms which act like slits, which again there will be three orientations of that are slightly closer together and this will produce the second of the two rings that we saw in the electron diffraction. So very carefully, I've stuck together three diffraction gratings of a thousand lines per millimetre film with 60 degrees of rotation in between them. So let's insert that in front of the violet laser and see if we get the rings. Oh dear, we get an interesting hexagonal pattern of dots, but we certainly don't get rings. What we're missing is that we don't have a single crystal of graphite, which would give this diffraction pattern, but we have polycrystalline graphite, which has lots of small crystals in many different orientations. To show this, I'm going to shine the laser onto the glow-in-the-dark film, and at the same time, rotate using this bearing the diffraction gratings that I've got stacked, and see what happens. Quickly, we can see that we get all the different orientations of the hexagonal pattern. 
And thanks to the fact that the violet photons of my violet laser excite the electrons in the glow-in-the-dark film, which then slowly de-excite, giving out light, we can see that those all those different orientations of the hexagonal pattern will produce beautiful circle. Which is a neat analogy to explain why all the different orientations of the graphite planes in the polycrystalline graphite produce circular interference patterns or diffraction pattern. The circular pattern persists on the glow-in-the-dark film for a while after you switch off the violet laser. Setting up the electron diffraction tube is relatively straightforward. Here I've got the blue leads connecting to the filament using the low voltage 6.3 volt AC supply. The positive high up voltage output of the EHT is connected with the red lead directly to the anode without the additional protective resistor. On my vintage tube, you don't have a separate connection for the negative of the EHT that just goes on to one of the low voltage outputs. But on some more modern tubes, it has a separate connection. Anyway, I hope I've inspired you to find out more about electron diffraction, and there are lots of links in the description where you can learn more. I'll finish with a few notes about safety. Make sure that you're using a current limited EHT power supply so that you can't give yourself a fatal electric shock. And when you're using a laser, make sure that you use a low power, less than one milliwatt laser and take the usual precautions to prevent it shining or reflections shining into your eye.